joining us tonight. Also, let me say while I'm thinking about it, don't forget, those of you who are part of our church, uh, we'll be delivering the food boxes again tomorrow. So if you need a food box or you know somebody who needs one, please come by. We also need uh, helping hands to take some of the boxes to uh, those, our, our widows, our widowers, our shut-ins, those who need a few boxes. If you can come and help deliver some of those, we'd love to have you come be with us. We'll have the fellowship hall over there open from 9 to 4. Uh, the box is on the left when you walk in over there on that side door. The box is on the left are those that are kind of for our shut-ins, widows, widowers, those that we know uh, that need help. And then the ones on the left are for just anybody that you know of, whether it's for yourself or for others. Uh, be sure to take some of those boxes with you as well. We just praise the Lord for the opportunity that we've had to do this and for it to be a blessing to others. I thank Brother Eddie for uh, thinking of us and, and, and doing that. Also, don't forget to be much in prayer for uh, uh, the, the Larkins family, uh, Sister Brenda. I pray that you just continue to watch over them uh, and that, that you would pray that God would just continue to watch over them and keep them close. All right. All right. Let's go on and get into the Word of God tonight as we look at Acts chapter number 4, starting in verse number 23. Now, if you go back last week, we looked at verses 1 through 22, or tw and, and we saw there in that passage of Scripture uh, this idea of vital boldness, okay? And we saw there some things that are required of believers if we're going to be bold in the day in which we live. In that early part of the chapter, we've seen that Peter and John are arrested for the miracle of healing the lame man. We've seen Peter's uh, sermon to the religious leaders. We've seen the religious leaders debate what's going on and tell the disciples, and this is the latter part of uh, starting in verse number 18 down through 22, they've told, the, they've told the apostles here, do not say anything else or do not preach or do any works in the name of Jesus Christ anymore. Of course, we know that they're in that context that Peter makes that statement that we must obey God rather than men. So we're picking up here in verse number 23, reading down through the rest of the chapter tonight. Acts chapter number 4, verse 23, And being let go, they went to their own company and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said unto them. And when they heard that, they lifted up their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, thou art God, which has made heaven and earth and the sea and all that in them is who by the mouth of thy servant David has said, Why did the heathen rage, and the people imagine vain things? The kings of the earth stood up, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For of a truth against thy holy child Jesus, whom thou hast anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, were gathered together. For to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determined before to be done. And now, Lord, behold their threatenings, and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak thy word, by stretching forth thine hand to heal, and that signs and wonders may be done by the name of thy holy child, Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken, where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake the word of God with boldness. And the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul, neither said any of them that all of the things which he possessed was his own, but they had all things common. And with great power he gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. Neither was there any among them that lacked, for as many as were possessors of lands or houses sold them, and brought the prices of the things that were sold, and laid them down at the apostles' feet, and distribution was made unto every man according as he had need. And Joseph, who by the apostles was surnamed Barnabas, which is being interpreted the son of consolation, a Levite and of the country of Cyprus, having land, sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, once again we come to you just thanking you for the privilege that we have to be together around your word tonight. Father, how I thank you for the ability to do these things across live stream. And Father, I pray that... Uh, even though it's still remote at this time, that how I thank you that the Holy Spirit of God indwells each and every one of us as your children and that he can speak to our hearts even if it is across a computer or a, ta or a tablet or a, or a phone. Father, I pray that you just have your way in the message tonight. Use me to share the truths that you'd have me to share. We'll give you the praise and glory for it all. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Now, 
Like I said, in the last message on the first 22 verses of chapter number 4, we began our study of vital boldness. Now, we're using the term vital in this particular context. We're using it from the standpoint of necessity or something being necessary. And in the days in which we live right now, I truly believe that the need to be bold is going to become ever more necessary. In that first message, in those first 22 verses, we saw that vital boldness requires some things from us as believers. First of all, we have to be aware of the fact that not everyone is going to like our message. If we're faithful in sharing the truth of the gospel at some time or another, we're going to face the anger of somebody who does not appreciate the message of that gospel. Now, related to that, we also saw that we have to be truthful. Sharing the gospel involves sharing both the bad news of sin as well as the good news of the gospel. We have to be careful that our boldness is not arrogance, but we have to be willing to stand even in the face of persecution. And then thirdly, we have to be authentic so that people will know beyond a shadow of a doubt that we love and have been with Christ. And then lastly, we have to be committed to the message of the gospel, both its necessity, its source, and its content. Now, in the message tonight, we're going to be looking at verses 23 through the end of the chapter here, and, and where in the first message we saw the elements necessary to have boldness, tonight we're going to be looking at what supports our efforts in the face of trials and what allows us to be bold in the first place, all right? So the first thing that we see here is that vital boldness, that necessary boldness, is nurtured by fellowship. Look at verse 23. And being let go, they went to their own company and reported all that the chief priests and the elders had said unto them. Now, as you look at that verse, you see that phrase, own company. Now, obviously, when you think about it, Think about that. It means that they went to a gathering where there were many believers in the early church. Now, in the Greek, it's really just one word, okay? Uh, and that word carries the idea that the apostles and probably the healed man as well went to those of similar background or similar relationship as they're all believers here. Now, at first glance, that doesn't seem like such a big thing to bring out, but I think that the Spirit wants us to see something special here in that word. The idea here is the same one used in John chapter number 1 and verse number 11 where it says that Jesus came unto his own and his own received him not. In other words, Christ went to the Jews. God's chosen people, those people who were specifically called out for a particular mission of revealing God to the rest of the world. Jesus was born as a Jew, thus not only did he have the covenant relationship with them as God to man, but there was a kindred element as well because he was of the tribe of Judah. He was a Jew speaking to other Jews. Now, this is why I think it's important, and I cannot emphasize this enough about this, how the necessity of uh, this fellowship plays into our boldness. So often, when persecution or trials hit a family or they hit a church, the first thing that they do is they begin to miss services. It may start out slowly at first, but over time, the person or the family participates less and less in the fellowship that should be an essential element of every church. Now, why is that a problem? Well, because it robs them of one of the sources of strength that God himself has provided for us in a time of trial. And that, and that resource is the fellowship that we have with other believers. Very rarely does God call us to a work where we're a lone ranger. Instead, he's provided through the church a means for us to share our fears and our victories, our needs, and our blessings. Now, think about it in relation to this passage here. I have no doubt that Peter and John shared how they were worried as they spoke 
to the, to the religious leaders, the Sadducees and the high priest, not knowing what these religious leaders were going to do. But I also can't help but believe that they spoke in odd terms as they repeated what God had spoken through them to those religious leaders and the strength and the courage that they felt as they stood boldly in the face of opposition. And, and what was the result of them sharing that with this group of believers? They were able to share their hearts and their fears with those who were like them, those who knew the same Savior and would very possibly face one day the very same kind of opposition. They had Jesus in common, and this gave their relationship a bond that transcended even the closest of earthly relationships. Now, interesting it's, not the, interesting, it's not the only time that we see this strengthening role of the fellowship during trials. When you study the book of Hebrews, what you find is that the believers who received this sermon, and I really believe that, that is, it's, Hebrews is as much of a sermon, if not more of a sermon, than even a letter, that these, these people who received this letter, these Hebrews, were Christian Jews who were beginning to feel persecution because of their forsaking of Judaism for Christ. This persecution probably was coming from two fronts. One, religious Jews were constantly stirring up trouble for Christians, as we see as we study the book of Acts. And secondly, the Jewish religion, Judaism itself, was a protected or an accepted religion in the Roman Empire. But Christianity was not. That meant it would be very easy for Jewish Christians who were being persecuted or who were being threatened by Roman authorities where these Hebrew believers lived, it would be easy for them to claim that they were a part of Judaism and not necessarily have to say that they were Christians. That way they wouldn't be persecuted for what they believed, but the problem, of course, with that is that it meant they would be denying the Savior. So the sermon, the book of Hebrews, which I believe truly came from Paul, was a wonderful explanation for why Christ was better than everything that these Jewish Christians had given up under Judaism. He was encouraging them in the book of Hebrews to stay true to their calling in Christ. And it's in part of this letter that we hear these familiar words from Hebrews chapter number 10, starting in verse 23. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling, of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Now notice what he said here. First of all, he says, hold on to your testimony. Then secondly, he says, pay attention to the needs of each other. Encourage each other in love and love one another and do what God's called you to do. And then he says, don't stop participating in the fellowship. And instead, he uses the fellowship, or he says to use the fellowship as a way to build each other up at all times, and even more when you can tell that persecution or trials are building. Now, notice that even in this day, and this was around the early AD 60s, okay, that there were some who were neglecting the strength of the fellowship when things got tough. And Paul says here that that's absolutely the worst thing that you can do. But notice also that there's instruction for the fellowship here. What should we as a body of believers provide to one another? Well, when you read those verses, you see that we're to be looking out for one another and we're to be listening to each other and we're to have an encouraging heart and we're to have a faithful presence and we're to also be a supporting voice. What we see in all of this is that one of the most powerful ways that we can t maintain a vital boldness in the face of trials or persecution is to spend time with our own company, those who know Jesus and who have a desire to be faithful to Him. We need to be faithful to the fellowship. We need to be faithful to the house of God because that is one way 
to encourage our boldness. But then secondly, we also see that vital boldness is nurtured by earnest prayer. And you see that starting in verse 24 all the way down through verse, 30, uh, verse number 31. When we talked about prayer and, and the importance of, 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 of corporate prayer in the church, we talked about this prayer just a little bit, bit there. But notice here the context of the prayer. As you look at this prayer, you see that it's a prayer with a particular petition and a particular intercession. Look at it, starting in verse 29. And now, Lord, behold their threatenings, and grant unto thy servant that with all boldness they may speak thy word, by stretching forth thine hand to heal, and that signs and wonders may be done by the name of thy holy child Jesus. So the first thing that we see here is that it's proper, just like we talked about this morning, individually, it's just as proper to do this corporately. It's just as proper to bring our petitions to God as part of our corporate prayer time. This is not only uh, in the time, uh, th and, and this is not the only time that we see this, for you'll, we'll see it again in Acts chapter number 12. Uh, when the church is praying for the release of Peter from prison. But not, notice also, just like we talked about this morning, that we also see adoration and we see worship, starting in verse 24. Lord, Thou art God, which has made heaven and earth and the sea and all that in them is, who by the mouth of Thy servant David has said, Why did the heathen rage and the people imagine vain things? The kings of the earth stood up and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against His Christ. For of a truth, against Thy holy child Jesus, whom Thou hast anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate with the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together for to do whatsoever Thy hand and Thy counsel to determine before to be done. Now remember that part of the purpose of prayer is to bring us into the presence of God in worship. And it cannot help but strengthen our faith if our prayers are wrapped in recognition and wrapped in appreciation of just who God is. In other words, we come in our prayer time with worship as much as we do petition. And that's exactly what we talked about this morning as we looked at, at Philippians 4, verses 6 and 7. Now, in this adoration and, and in this worship, we see first of all His majesty. They say, Lord, Thou art God. Then we see His power, it says, which has made heaven and earth and, and the sea and all that in them is. And then we see His omniscience it says, who by thy mouth of thy servant David has said, why did the heathen rage? And then on down there through verse number 27, they lay out the fact that God has already been working and ordaining the situation. And then we see his sovereignty for to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determined before to be done. Can you imagine the encouragement that that kind of prayer would bring as you're facing a, a time of trial or persecution of some sort. To be reminded, first of all, that you're praying to the God who created everything and who loved you so much that He's given you the right to climb up into His lap and call Him Papa. And then to be surrounded by others who are praying for you and with you and with each other for boldness, as it says there in verse number 29, and for God to do something wonderful and great during the trial. And now, Lord, behold their threatenings and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak thy word. It's not hard to see why prayer would be a necessity to maintaining boldness. But then we also see, thirdly, that vital boldness is nurtured by an empowered witness. Look at verse 31. And the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul. Neither said any of them that aught of the things which he possessed was his own, but they had all things common. And then we continue to read there. The last part of this verse is what captures our attention. They prayed for boldness in verse 29. And God greatly answered their prayer as we see in verse 31. And when they had prayed 
the place was shaken where they were assembled together and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and they spake the Word of God with boldness. There's a lesson here that if we're not careful can be almost brushed aside as a cliché. And we've all heard the statement before that when you fall off a horse, you have to get back on as quickly as possible and ride again. And the reason for that is so that fear or discouragement doesn't have time to set in before you get back on and ride. And there's a similar lesson here as well. But it goes so much beyond just a mere cliché. Yes, the apostles and the other believers went out again and began immediately witnessing again. And and in some respects, it did have the same kind of impact that getting on a horse again would have. But here's what I want you to see. It just wasn't the apostles, Peter and John, that went back into the streets. It was the whole fellowship. Again, look at verse 31. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake the word of God with boldness. Now, stop and think about that for just a moment. Peter and John, two of the apostles, have just been threatened for their witness, and yet the entire fellowship goes out and witnesses to a lost city about their need of the Messiah that they've just killed. What a boldness. And here's what I want to see, I want us to see about this. In the face of what they knew and what they understood would be tremendous opposition. The entire first church of Jerusalem trusted God and they witnessed. God had given the church her orders to start at Jerusalem and evangelize and it didn't matter what opposition that these believers might face. They trusted God and told others about Christ. The lesson for us is this. If you want to strengthen your boldness, then tell other people about Jesus. Now, many people will say, it frightens me to witness. And and we should. When we're witnessing for Christ, we ought to have a healthy concern. Don't get me wrong. I understand that. Because we're talking to somebody about the need of their soul. But if we want to overcome the fear of witnessing, The solution is not to wait until the perfect time or we come in contact with the perfect person. Instead, it's to be bold and tell others about the Lord who saved us. The strength comes as we share the gospel. But then lastly, we see in verses 32 through 37 that vital boldness is nurtured through continued ministry. Now, if you read verses 32 down through verse number 37, you also see here uh, a very similar sound to what we've already seen in chapter number 2, starting in verse 42. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all that believed were together and had all things common, and sold their possessions and goods, and parted them to all men as every man had need. And they continuing daily with one accord in the temple, and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. I don't think that this repetition in chapter number 2 and almost the, in some cases almost the identical wording in chapter number 4 is accidental or just a way to fill up space. What this tells us is that despite the threat of persecution, the early, the early church kept on being the church. What she was at her core, she continued to do. And to be honest with you, that's one way that I fear the church of today in America has lost its moorings. Oftentimes when the church has felt threatened, it's grown quiet. But more than ever, the church needs to be the church. It needs to minister and to serve and to witness and to preach and to teach 
the truth of God. Continuing to be what God wants us to be is a surefire way to nurture the boldness that we need. We're seeing this play out right now in our country in the state of California. And the truth of the matter is, it may be coming to our door as well. Tonight we've looked at several keys to maintaining vital boldness, even in the face of persecution and trials and threats. The main message is simply this. Stay the course. The very keys to maintaining an effective witness in difficult times really boils down to being faithful in what we already know. Vital boldness is nurtured by an appreciation of the fellowship of believers. A reliance on prayer. A strong witness and a faithful ministry. That's what we see starting in chapter, chapter number 4, verse 23, down through verse 37. But we have to realize that these must be in place, and I cannot state this strongly enough. These things have to be in place before persecution arises. If it's already, if these four things are not already an important part of our lives before the hard times come, it's very difficult to try to establish them after the persecution starts. So the question tonight for us as a church is this. Are the keys that make for a vital boldness in the hard times, are those keys already present in our lives now? Is there an appreciation of the fellowship of believers? Is there a reliance on prayer? Is there a strong witness? And is there a faithful ministry? Those things are going to need to be in place if they're not already, they're going to need to be in place soon because we're going to need these keys to help us remain bold in the days that are coming. Father, I've shared what you'd have me to share tonight. I pray that it's been a blessing and a help. Father, I know that it's hard to listen sometimes to somebody say, persecution is coming our way. But Father, as Christians, we can't put our heads in the sand and we have to realize that right now we're in a very blessed position. We have the opportunity to make sure that these four keys are a part of our church and how we interact with each other and how we interact with the world and how we even interact in our relationship with you. And we can establish those things and make sure that they're solidly grounded in how we minister as a church so that when the persecution does come, these things will bring us strength when we need it the most. And it will help us to exhibit a vital boldness when it's going to be more necessary than ever that people see that they need Jesus. Father, help us to be that kind of a church. And we'll give you the praise and the glory for all that you do. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Thank you so much again for being with us tonight. I appreciate you uh, joining us for our time in the Word. This coming Wednesday night, we're continuing on in our series around uh, standing on solid ground. Uh, on you know how to apply the Bible to current events and issues and and I actually had a question uh, asked to me and I've been praying about uh, you know when to work this in and God said just to take a little bit of a break I feel God leading just to take us a little bit of a break uh, away from the social justice issues we talked about racism and social justice and and immigration and there's still a couple of things that we need to talk about in that realm but God's kind of burdened my heart to take a little bit of a break from that and then come back to it. Uh, because I got a question from somebody a very re that had just recently happened to them. And it was around this idea of the Christian and social drinking. And I had already earmarked one of the things for our discussion around this idea of where in our country right now we're seeing marijuana legalized on a state-by-state -state basis, not just medicinal uses now, but recreational use. 
And so I'd already earmarked to talk about that, and the issues related to that are also very similar to those around uh, social drinking and those kind of things. So we're actually going to talk about that, uh, both social drinking and the legalization of marijuana, uh, as a topic starting this Wednesday night and what the Christian's view of that should be. Is, is it, if, if, legal, if marijuana is legalized, is it okay for the Christian? And like I said, we're going to see a lot of overlap between that and this idea of social drinking. So we're going to handle it all as kind of one little group here. Uh, so just be much in prayer for that, that God used me to share what he'd have me to share there, okay? And then on Sunday morning, we return to our Come Unto Me series on finding God's peace in an anxious world. And we're going to look specifically at the ang- how to handle the anxiety that arises because of grief, all right? Uh, that was one of the question, one of the folks that asked me about that and how to, how to deal with that particular situation. So we're going to look at that next Sunday morning. So you just be much in prayer that God would guide me and lead me to do what he'd have me to say there. And then on Sunday night, we'll be back in the book of Acts starting in chapter number 5. All right. So just continue to pray that God would have his way. If you need anything, I should be at the church most days in normal times except for the uh, Wednesday when I've got to go up to uh, Mountain, uh, Mountain Home to do the uh, graveside service there. Like I said, be much in prayer in, in relation to that. Uh, and, but like I said, if you need anything, come by the church. Don't forget, the boxes are here. can be delivered tomorrow or picked up tomorrow. So the, church, the fellowship hall will be open from 9 to 4. So you come by and grab what you need or grab what you want to deliver to those in our community uh, that we can be a blessing to. All right, God bless you. Have a great rest of the evening and a great week.